uh, Proverbs chapter 1. If you want to get your Bibles out. There's, there's a lot in Proverbs that deals with the heart of man. Uh, the thing that I love, and, and I told the children this week uh, during VBS, the three books of the Bible that I love the most uh, is the book of Psalms, because in there you see God's heart. I love the book of Proverbs because you, you find out who you are as a person in there. You, you see your own heart. And I love the book of John because you see Jesus Christ as God. Uh, those are my three favorite books. Uh, that, those are the reasons I love those books. But in Proverbs chapter 1, we see that there is uh, there's a harsh rebuke that we're going to see today. This is, a, this is a picture of God that is not usually depicted, generally speaking. But this is the God of the Bible. Now, I want to preface all of this that God is love. The Bible tells us that. God is love. That is who he is. Uh, As we look into 1 Corinthians 13, we won't get there tonight, maybe next week, but as we get into 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we see charity played out and listed out as to what it is. And of course, love is how you feel about somebody. Charity is how you show it. Okay? Um, But in that, we see that if this is an accurate description of charity and love, and that God is love, that there in 1 Corinthians 13 is an accurate description of God. But God is a God who is a just God and a righteous God, and he will not tolerate sin. He will not. I believe, as as the word says, that there is a time of ignorance that God will wink at. But once things are known... Just as we see in Leviticus chapter 4, there is a time when ignorance is no longer an excuse, and we are called to account. Romans chapter 1 and chapter 2 show us that the entire world is guilty before God, and there is nobody without excuse, because that which can be known of God is written on their hearts. So in Proverbs chapter 1, I'm, honestly, I'm not sure how this is going to play out. I have a few other references we're going to turn to. I have a bunch of verses that I've printed off that I would like to read to us when we get a little further on. If you have pen and paper, jot the references down, go back, meditate over these things, uh, find out where God would have you to fall in all of this. But let's start right out in Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 20. Wisdom crieth without. She uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief places of concourse, in the openings of the gates. In the city she uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you, I will make known my words unto you. Now, we understand from other places in studying this word wisdom, this wisdom is speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Wisdom crieth in the streets. There is so much in this world that cries out, God is real. You see just the very fact of all the evil in the world, that there has to be a God, there, and that is the argument that is quite often, honestly, quite often used, is that, well, how can there be a God with all the wickedness in the world? Well, the very fact that you recognize that there is wickedness shows that there is a little bit of light in you. And darkness cannot dispel light. Light, by its very nature, dispels darkness. You're in a dark room. You can't shovel darkness out. You can't sweep it out. You can't push it out. The only way to get rid of the darkness is to turn on the light. Because you recognize darkness in the world, that shows that there is a light in you. That light is shown to us in John chapter 1, verse 9, and that is that true light which lighteth every man which cometh into the world. That light is Jesus Christ. 
Tying right in with Romans 1 of what we said, that every single person knows that there is a God. I had a really great conversation with an atheist just a week and a half ago. And they claimed right out, no, I'm, I'm an atheist. I, I don't believe that there is a God. And I honestly, I don't remember the entire conversation that we had. That's between us and the Lord and them. Uh, but there were a few things that I was able to lay out before her to show her that there is a God. She knows that there is a God by the very nature of her attack against God. And then we reasoned together. We reasoned about DNA. We reasoned about creation. We reasoned about the Big Bang. We reasoned about the origin of everything. What is the source? And by the end of the conversation, she was accepting of it, still holding on to her hatred and anger toward God. And that's what it boiled down to. She's angry at God. Somebody who is angry at God does not know God. That's why I don't believe a true, born-again believer can be angry at God. I don't believe it's possible. Because if you know Jesus Christ, then you have the mind of Christ. And can Christ himself be angry at his own father? No. I don't believe a born-again believer can be angry at God. So if you're sitting here today and you're saying and have said in your heart before, I am just, the, my problem is I'm just angry with God. You need to check your walk and make sure that you are in the faith. Because you may just be holding to a false profession. You may not truly be born again. You may be still lost. But how long, it says here again, how long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity and scorners delight in their scorning and fools hate knowledge? All of these things are depictions of us. This is who we are. We are fools. We are simple. We are scorners. But how long are you going to cling to that stuff? How long will you remain in your foolishness? He says and commands, turn you at my reproof. Now, as we look in the, in, throughout the Bible and we see the word rebuke, we see the roof, re, word reprove, and we see the word correction. All right? uh, the word of God is for these things. Preach the word, be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. These are the things that we must do. Exhortation is a challenge. It isn't encouraging somebody. There might be a little bit of encouragement in it, but it is a challenge to somebody. Get yourself up and start walking right. That's an exhortation, okay? Walk in the way that you know you're supposed to walk. That's something you can do, okay? Uh, that's an exhortation. A rebuke is you are being a fool right now. You are headed towards destruction. You need to turn around. All right? That's why it says, rebuke not an elder. Okay, that, that means elder in the church, as far as older folks, but it also means elder as in positions of authority, what we would call the deacons, uh, anybody that would be an authority over you, your Sunday school teacher, the pastor. Now, you can reprove me. I welcome reproof. Your Sunday school teachers ought to welcome reproof. Because Apollos is a perfect picture of somebody who welcomed reproof. Apollos was very knowledgeable in the scriptures, but he only knew up until the baptism of John. He preached it fervently. And when Priscilla and Aquila, that husband and wife team, came along and reproved him and showed him the way of God more perfectly, he became a powerhouse for the cause of Christ. He greatly persuaded people then because he was able to take the reproof, all right? You always need to be teachable, always. It doesn't matter how long you've sat in a pew or how short you've sat in a pew or how long you've stood behind a pulpit or what, you need to always be teachable. Always be ready to learn. And honestly, when Paul charged Timothy, let no man despise thy youth, he's saying they will but despise your youth but don't let them. Don't allow it to happen. You assert the authority you have, and you instruct them, and prove by the word of God 
that you know what you're talking about. The Word of God speaks for itself. Age has no bearing whatsoever. We could have an 11-year-old child, and if he was born again and led by the Spirit of God, and God had his hand on him, he could stand behind this pulpit and reprove and rebuke us. And we ought to take that. But he says, Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my Spirit upon you. I will make known my words unto you. Has he not made known his words unto us? How, how did he do that? How, how did he show us his words? You notice that's a plural S there? It's not just word in general. It's words. God doesn't just care about the general idea of the passage. He cares about individual words. And it proves it here even still. I'll make known my words unto you. You'll know everything that you need to know. Look at verse 24. <clears throat> because I have called and you refused, I have stretched out my hand and no man regarded. But ye have said it not my, all my counsel and would none of my reproof. Basically, to set something at naught is to take it, consider it, and you know what? I don't need that. And you toss it out. We did a lot of that at spring cleaning. We got a lot, rid of a lot of just junk that had accumulated over the years. And that's good. It's refreshing, isn't it? But when the Lord God hands you something and says, this will transform your life, and you regard it, and you toss it out, and you say, I don't need that. You set it aside. This is what he's rebuking you for here. He's given you what you need, and you've refused it. There is danger in that. Because he says right here at verse 26, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then they shall call upon me, but I will not answer. Why is this God never preached? Why do we never see this God the vengeful God, the jealous God, the God that will not allow sin to continue, the God who gives you a chance and another chance and another chance and another chance and another chance and then finally says, that's it, no more chances. That's what this is saying here. There is coming a time where God will refuse you. Be careful how you walk toward Almighty God. He is not a force that you can reckon with. Then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. You see, here is the key. We are stupid. And God understands that. I am a fool. I am an idiot. And God understands that. He knoweth my frame. He knows that I am dust. But there is a difference between being a fool and, a, and stupid and just hard-headed and can't learn and rejecting the truth that has been clearly presented to you. Because he says here, this is the reason. This is the reason why he will laugh when your calamity comes. Why he'll mock when fear comes upon you. Why he, your, when desolation comes and destruction like a whirlwind and distress and anguish. Why he'll laugh at that. It's because you hated knowledge and chose not the fear of the Lord. It says... They would none of my counsel. They despised all my reproof. Listen, what is it about the word of God that you hate? 
we're all good at picking the things we love out of it. But what about this book is it that you hate? If there's something in here that you despise, be very careful because you are treading on dangerous ground. Just as God told Cain, he said, listen, if you do well, will you not be rewarded? But if you do not well, sin lieth at the door. What is it about this book? What in here have you read lately, or you've heard preached lately, or you've seen lately, or you've heard lately, or God reminded of you lately, and you shuddered at the thought? I will not take that because I know better, God. You're wrong. That's exactly what you're saying. That's what these people are saying. And then, when your world falls apart, when your marriage falls apart, when your wife runs off with another man, when your children fall into deep sin, when your world comes crashing down around you, you shake your fist at God because he did this to you. You're a fool. You've allowed this into your own life. It's your own choices and your own actions that have forced God's judgment hand. And he's mocking you in your fear. He's laughing at you in your calamity. Because you would none of his reproof. He tried. Time and time and time again. Honestly, this is, this is why I believe God gives us this free will. Because if God was just controlling every single aspect of our minds, we would have no choice. He would be a wicked God because he would laugh at something that we had no choice over. That's not the God of the Bible. The God of the Bible wants you to fear him. He wants you to understand who he is. He wants you to fall down on your knees and beg for his mercy. That's the God of the Bible. Everything else all coming into play is a God of love and a God of mercy. His mercies are new every morning. But if you refuse to get up early in the morning and seek those early mercies, you're going to miss them. I've had it where I've slept in way too late. I get, get into the Word of God, same routine. I do the same things, I sit in the same seat, drink the same cup of coffee, read the same passages, and there's nothing there. But then there are times when God wakes me up out of a dead sleep, and I get into my Bible, and it may be early, and there is something powerful there. I'm telling you, the Bible is specific for a reason. Whatever God has shown you this last week, you best be acting on it. Don't set it to naught. This may be your last chance before he laughs at your life falling apart. These are hard truths to grasp. I understand. I get it. As the Lord revealed this to me throughout the week and then solidified it in my heart last night and this morning, I asked for prayer this morning because I understand how this sounds. I understand what this makes God look like. And I understand how hard it is to receive. This is nothing from me. I want to read you some verses here. Job 27, 8 through 9 says this, For what is the hope of the hypocrite? Though he hath gained, when God hath taken away his soul, will God hear his cry when trouble cometh upon him? Jeremiah 11, 9 through 12, And the Lord said unto me, A conspiracy is found among the men of Judah and among the inhabitants of Jerusalem. They are turned back to the iniquities of their forefathers, which refused to hear my words. And they went after other gods to serve them. The house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken my covenant, which I made with their fathers. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will bring evil upon them. Who is it that brought the evil? God. 
which they shall not be able to escape. And though they shall cry unto me, I will not hearken unto them. Then shall the cities of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem go and cry unto the gods to whom they offer incense, but they shall not save them at all in their time of trouble. Listen, the gods that you are sacrificing to, the God of your family, the God of your job, the God of your money, the God of your own flesh, they will not save you in the day of calamity. And your God, almighty God, is jealous against them. You're treading on dangerous ground. The Lord arranged all of this in Brother Theron's openings and in, in bringing out the fact that we are a self-centered people. Listen, if you are worshiping yourself, you are not worshiping Almighty God. And if you are not worshiping Almighty God, you are worshiping a dumb idol, which will lead you to destruction. Zechariah chapter 11 talks about the idol shepherd, and that's I-D-O-L. The shepherd that leads you to idols. Now, this is speaking of the Antichrist. But is not that spirit of Antichrist already at work in this world? What shepherd are you following? Jeremiah 14, 10 says this, Thus saith the Lord unto this people, Thus have they loved to wander. They have not refrained their feet. Therefore the Lord doth not accept them. He will now remember their iniquity and visit their sins. Then said the Lord unto me, pray not for this people for their good. Can you imagine that? God telling somebody, don't pray for the good of that people. When they fast, I will not hear their cry. When they offer burnt offering and oblation, I will not accept them. But I will consume them by the sword, by the famine, by the pestilence. Ezekiel chapter 8, verse 17 and 18. Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Is it a light thing to the house of Judah that they commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence, and have returned to provoke me to anger. And lo, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore will I also deal in fury. Mine eye shall not spare, neither will I have pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, yet will I not hear them. Micah 3, 4, Then shall they cry unto the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at, this, at that time, as they behave themselves in ill in their doings. Zechariah chapter 7, verse 11, But they refused to hearken, and pulled away the shoulder, and stopped their ears, that they should not hear. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone, lest they should hear the law, and the words which the Lord of hosts had sent his by, in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. Wherefore it has come to pass, that as he cried, and they would not hear, so they cried, I would not hear, saith the Lord of hosts. But I scattered them with a whirlwind among the nations whom they knew not. Thus the land was desolate after them that no man passed through nor returned, for they laid the pleasant land desolate. This is not an isolated incident, but it does come from God offering reproof, offering correction, offering rebuke, offering that way of escape. But there is a continual, a continual, a continual rejection. Did you hear that? They pulled the shoulder away. They stopped their ears from the hearing of the word of God. They wouldn't have it. They wouldn't take it. They knew it's what they needed. They knew it was what they needed to hear to change their lives, to make their life what God needed it to be. They refused to hear it. And so what did God do? He rewarded them according to their deeds. The things that you are reaping in your home today is what you have sown in it years past. The things that you are reaping in your own life today is what you have sown in your life in years past. It is nothing that God has done to spite you. God loves you enough to give you over to that stuff. Does not the book of Romans say that he'll harden whom he will harden, but he'll have mercy upon whom he'll have mercy? You need to just get it into your head that God is the ruler over all. 
And some people, he may need to harden their heart to the point where they break before he can use them. Some people, he can soften their heart and soften their neck to the point where he can use them. Jude lists that right out. Some save with fear, hating even the spotting of the flesh, uh, spotted the garment stained by the flesh. But others save with compassion. Which way is it going to be with you? Are you going to take the correction from the Lord? When he lays a biblical truth out before you, will you take that or will you reject it? What is it about your walk with God that you are shying away from? Because that is the area he is trying to shed the light on. That dark corner of your heart that you don't want to look at, maybe it's your pride, maybe it's your bigotry, maybe it's your hatred, maybe it's your covetousness, maybe it's your lust. Whatever it is, you're trying to hide it from God, and God is there, and he sees it, and he's shining the light on it, and he's taking your head, and he's trying to force you to see it and say, this is what you need to have. Change that. Look at that. Look at this thing. This is the problem. I want to fix it. I want to change it. I want to change your heart. I want to take it from a heart of stone and make it into a heart of flesh. I want you to be able to love. I want you to have compassion. But this is stopping it. Why do we refuse his hand? I refused the Lord's hand for years. And I've reaped what I've sowed. I know folks in this congregation that have refused the Lord's hand for years, and you're reaping exactly what you have sown in your own lives. Repent, or you shall all likewise perish. Isaiah 1.15 says this, Your new moons, this is verse 14, your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. There's a couple places I want us to turn to. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 3. This is speaking of Jesus. Let's start in verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Basically, get your eyes back on Christ. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. How hard are you fighting this thing? How badly do you really want God to bless your life and your marriage? How badly do you really want God to bless your finances? How badly do you really want God in your life? Remember Daryl Champlin preached here many times. We had that, it was, it was an honor and a privilege. At the time, I didn't understand what we had while he was here. But he spoke of a time and, and there, was a, there was a poem that he read, and I don't remember the poem exactly, but it was basically, I'll take $3 worth of God, please. You remember that? Not enough to change my world or to make me odd or out of place, but just enough to give me a good feeling, to get me along my way and to help me along. N -n -n, give me $3 worth of God, please. Not, not enough to really make me a fanatic or make me stand out in the world, but just enough to get me out of my own troubles. I only want three dollars worth of God, please. You have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Verse 5, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. 
For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Pastor Asquith's wife uh, tells the story of, of it, was, it was years that they had been married before she was finally born again. And she used to look at her husband, and when he would get out of line, God would chasten him. And he would, God would, would, would punish him and straighten him up. And, and she used to sit there and think, why doesn't he do that to me? I can be mean and angry and miserable, and this is her own words. I'm not putting words in her mouth at all. I can do all of these things and be miserable, and, and God does nothing to me. Why? And she realized eventually, finally, it's because she wasn't saved. When she finally found salvation in Jesus Christ, it was maybe a couple weeks later. She was in the kitchen, and they had had seven children. This is, this is Pastor Asquith's own words. I'm relaying the story to you. And her, her ankles and feet were a little swollen from having so many children and just being a housewife and a mother, and you know how that is, okay? She opened up the refrigerator, and a jar fell out and smashed on her foot. And you can imagine what happened to the foot. Well, there was a lot of blood, and it, it wasn't pretty. They called the ambulance. They came and got her, and she was just rejoicing tears flowing down her face. He loves me. He loves me. He's not going to let me be that way anymore. He loves me. Because God the Father was finally chastening her. It's why we don't, why we don't refuse and despise the chastening of the Lord. Don't shrug your shoulder away at it. Don't pull your ears away. Don't, don't stop up your ears. Don't, don't turn away from the reproof. When God gives you clear direction, I don't care how contrary it is to what you think ought to happen or ought to work or needs to happen or should happen. Take his way. Your way is wrong. Every single time. If your way is contrary to the word of God, your way is wrong. Our human pride is a wicked thing, though. You know that? Because in our pride, we can excuse our actions. I did this because she did that. I did this because I deserve that because I'm not getting this. I act this way because. Oh, but God, you don't understand my situation. You don't know what I've been put through. You don't know the pain I've seen. I'm pretty sure that we have a high priest which was touched with a feeling of our infirmities. And he was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. That's why Jesus Christ took on flesh. Listen, there is nothing that you can bring before Almighty God. No excuse, no argument that you can bring to him and say, God, this is why my way is better. You will not stand before God and explain to him why he ought to let you in. You will not stand before him and explain to him why he was wrong in allowing this in your life or allowing that to happen in your life or this calamity or this pain or this heartache or these sleepless nights. Do you know why? Because he's God. He's in eternity past. He's in eternity future. He's here with us now. Jesus Christ said, before Abraham was, I am. You really think you're going to excuse it away to God? You know what you need to do. We heard a harsh warning this morning of what can happen if you continue to refuse his reproof. We also see the love of a father. Listen, this is the same God that is long-suffering towards us and that he is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. But guess what? You have to come to repentance or you shall all likewise perish. 